Am I moving it? No. Uh, there we go. Right, I want to thank everybody today uh, for letting us lecture to you guys today. Um, my name is Kevin Muldowney and my wife Kathleen. We are both physical therapists in Rhode Island. Um, I can't see anybody whatsoever out there, so I'll assume you're here. Um, I've been treating EDS since uh, 2007. We have currently two practices in Rhode Island and we treat about 125 EDS patients every week. So we are a huge EDS clinic. Um, with that, we only have four therapists, so everybody in my clinic uses the Muldowney protocol. Um, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk a little bit about how we use it. Um, how, did I, how did I develop the protocol is just, basically when I first started, there was no real technical protocol for anybody. And basically what happened was, is I said, you have to have some kind of generalities of dysfunctions. And I set out to kind of look for that. I looked at hundreds of EDS patients. And even though everybody's a little bit different, you have some general dysfunctions that happen in your population. So my protocol is gonna work on those general dysfunctions. We really looked at what the biomechanical causes were and our big thing was we wanted to do no harm. So when we do our exercise protocol, not only do I look at is it going to affect that joint that I'm working on, but I also look at every other joint in the body to make sure that doesn't hurt. So a good example of that is you'll never see sideline hip abduction or sideline clam in my clinic, not only because it's a good exercise for strengthening the hip, but it dislocates shoulders in this population, and that's something we don't want to do. Uh, where is your pain coming from? Um, basically what we're looking for here are what are the biomechanical dysfunctions. Kathleen is going to go over different things that affect our protocol that are non-physical therapy related. So I'll let her talk about that. Uh, where do we begin when everything hurts? I'll talk about that in a little bit. The big point is, is when I developed this protocol, the hardest thing for me to do was figure out level one. Um, how do I get people that don't exercise, have a lot of pain, where do I stop them without injuring them? And really what we focused on is getting rid of inflammation in the body at the beginning. So we use muscle activation and muscle pumping to get rid of inflammation in the body. That's our first levels to try to help you guys. And then we actually focus on toning the body rather than strengthening it. So we use a lot of high repetitions and low resistance. We try to progress you slowly through the exercises and we use time to actually work on all of our exercises. Why do we use a standardized protocol in my practice and why I believe we should have a standardized protocol? The one is consistency among therapists. So all of our therapists in our clinic use our protocol. So we all start at the SI joint and we all work up and down. So that way a patient has consistency when they're here. Also, we can also figure out, is there a problem that we missed? So again, I'm not perfect, nobody's perfect, we miss things, especially in a population that has many things wrong. So we've been using the protocol so long, we kind of know where you should be in that protocol at all times. So if you're not where you're supposed to be, um, pain-wise, exercise tolerance-wise, it's a good time for us to relook at that and say, okay, did we miss something? Or is something else affecting us not allowing that protocol to go through? And also, unfortunately, not everybody likes to exercise, so it gives me a good idea if you're compliant or not with my exercise program. So I like to really spend a lot of the time on basically the protocol itself, all right? The protocol is listed in my book, so there's different chapters in the book that we use. So where do you begin with someone who has pain everywhere throughout their body? That's a good question. Besides crying as a physical therapist, what else should you do? All right, so we decided in our clinic that we're gonna start with the SI joint. All right, the SI joint is basically the two dimples of your butt, and it's where the sacrum and the ilium attach. The pelvic bone biomechanically 
is considered the top part of the leg, where the sacrum is considered the bottom part of the spine. So this is where your head, arm, and trunk travel down your spine, make a little oblique angle, and go down to the floor. Also, when you're walking, jumping, or running, this is where the ground reaction forces of those grounds travel up your leg all the way up to your neck. So we decided we were gonna start there. And the reason why is once we fix the SI joint, it really helps me below the leg and up to the neck to make some determinations of what other biomechanical problems there are. And are those biomechanical problems in the neck just a compensation for the SI? Um, again, back in the day where there was really nothing to help me out to figure it out, a lot of our research was trial and error. Okay, so we kind of know what to do, and we kind of know what not to do. Um, I apologize to all those patients when we didn't know what to do, um, but we're pretty good at it right now. So when you look at my protocol in the SI joint, we have two levels, they're called mat exercises and they're called ball exercises. The mat exercises you can do on a bed or on a floor, and they're really designed to actually help stabilize the pelvis and the hip. The ball exercises you do on a giant physio ball, and they're designed to stabilize the sacrum as well as L5 all the way up to L1. So a lot of patients have SI joint dysfunction as well as facet joint pathology, which gives them a lot of pain. We do have a few things that we do with people that have special considerations in our clinic that we've actually been doing over the last seven years. And I will talk about each one of those for everybody who's been using my protocol. Uh, are there people using my protocol now? Or have my book? <laughs> I can't see, but I'm assuming some have <laughs> at this point. I'm really blinded by this, that's okay. All right, so people with unstable hips. When we started the protocol, people, some of my people have some really unstable hips. So we actually put in our protocol what we call an AB protocol. And those are for people who have pretty bad hips and some of the exercises bothered the hips. So we actually found some other exercises that they can do without injuring the hips. We also use things like Osgood braces to help stabilize it, as well as some taping techniques that we do in our clinic with rock tape. The other one in this chapter that we really worry about is bulging discs and spondylolisthesis. What we found was is that when we do those, those patients that come with us with SI joint dysfunction as well as a bulging disc, what we do is we actually say, okay, we're gonna reverse the protocol a little bit. And we're gonna start with the ball exercises first and then go to the mat. We're also gonna use a little bit of SI joint decompression, which is basically a low level traction. I would never suggest to do traction on anybody, but it's very specific to a, the joint where your uh, disc is. And we also um, uh, work on taping an SI joint belt. So once we finish that and we stabilize the SI joint, we could really go up or down either one. So we can either go to the low extremities or we could go to the neck. In my book, I started the third chapter of the neck because most people have neck issues. So when we're looking at the neck, we're looking at posture. Really, we're a big posture group here. And I look at forward head posture. So normal posture should be ears over shoulders over hips. For every inch my head is forward, there is a 10 pound compressive force pushing down on my spine, killing that poor little C1, C2 that we call CCI. All right, so we work diligently on posture in our clinic. And we do an exercise that we actually been doing now for about three years that is not in the book called posture against the wall. And almost every physical therapist knows how to do this. We learned this in PT school. But we really started working on it where you stand up against the wall, you tighten your stomach and your buttocks, you squeeze your shoulder blades back and you try to tuck your chin. And what we're finding is our patients, we make them hold this position for one minute every hour they're awake. And when they're doing this exercise, we're reducing forward head posture by a half an inch a month. 
So it's a pretty significant thing. It's, it's pretty exciting to see what's going on with it. And uh, just that exercise alone has been a game changer for a lot of my patients. When we come to our protocol, the big thing that bothers chapter three are unstable shoulders. Your shoulder usually subluxes forward and down. So we do certain taping techniques with Lugo tape and cover tape. Um, if you go on to our Facebook page, which is actually the name of the book, Living Life to the Fullest with Ellis Daniels Syndrome, I have a four minute video for physical therapists and anybody who wants to learn on how to tape a shoulder for EDS, because that's how important it is for them to progress through my protocol. So we do some taping techniques in our clinic. We also teach um, family members how to tape. We're a big teaching facility because we know ehlers Daniel Syndrome is a genetic disorder. It's gonna be with you forever. So anything we can teach a family member to do safely, we are gonna teach them. So taping shoulders, fixing SI joints at home, fixing knees, that is all normal stuff we do with them. We videotape it for the uh, caregiver or a family member. We go over it at nauseam until they feel comfortable with it. Um, so that's important for us, because I think that's important that somebody can actually help you at home so you're not constantly going to a caregiver. Um, so the other thing we talk about with this is CCI, AI, and Chiari. All right, and that's a big one for a lot of my patients. So can my protocol help that? The answer is, I don't know. All right, so some of the Chiari's that aren't as bad or CCI's that aren't as bad, yes, we've had some good success helping. But sometimes the Chiari or the CCI is so bad, you need surgery, you know? Eventually all it is is a chin tuck. I mean, there's only so much we can do with that, all right? And anybody who can say they can get rid of all, all CCIs with exercise, it's, it's really not the case. But the big thing I talk about with all my patients with CCI as we go through the protocol is that even if you're actually not doing well with it, we can actually get you stronger so when you go into surgery, you're much stronger. And the thing we really work on with my patients with CCI is shoulder strengthening. Because the stronger your shoulders are, the better you actually come out of CCI surgery, I guarantee that. I work with Dr. Bolognese. We actually work very hard at getting the patient's shoulders strong. We can actually do shoulder exercises even laying down with an aspen collar so it doesn't bother your neck. But the stronger it is, the better it is for you. All right, so after that, we're looking at chapter four, which is the lower extremity. I'm looking at the foot, because the foot really, when the foot hits the ground, everything changes. I am a big component of orthotics, custom orthotics, from someone who understands um, EDS. But when you can control the foot, you can control the ankle and the knee and the hip. So if we can get somebody that actually get us a good custom orthotic, willing to make adjustments, because the adjustments could be five or six times, then we're gonna be in good shape. We can also teach family members how to fix the knee and tape the knee as well. Um, but that's really what we wanna do with that. Then when we're done with that, we go to chapter five, which is more functional training. And this is kind of where I find that a lot of physical therapists start a little bit too early. And this is balance, twisting, uneven terrain, things like that. We have a throwing protocol to throw a ball, things, things in that nature, because now you're strong enough to start doing that. And if you start this a little bit too early and you're not strong enough to absorb those kinds of forces, then that's where we kind of get in trouble as physical therapists because we're rushing the system. Once you're done with my book, you only have to do my protocol three times a week. You'll do chapter two one time, you'll do chapter three and chapter four, all different days. Then we usually try to let our patients go back either to a gym or a Pilates place. At the gym, I only let you do about 15 to 25 reps. Um, dangerous exercise that I have for that is I don't really like elliptical machines because they pop your SI joint out. I'm not a big fan of running because it's 10 times ground reaction forces pushing up on your hip and knee. So whatever you weigh, put a zero on it and tell me if you can lift that, it's pretty difficult. Um, 
Swimming, you just got to worry about the shoulders, kickboards and snorkels, a lot of my patients do. Um, the recumbent bike is really the best um, that I find for patients with EDS. I, lo I love recumbent bikes. Um, these are just a list of braces that we use in our clinic that I, I found pretty good for everybody. I try to go as cheap as possible because most braces are not actually covered by insurance. So we work really hard. Um, all of these can go on this uh, company that we just started called Amazon, and uh, I think they got cash. I think they're going under soon, so I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> but for me, for my final thoughts on everything is, people come up to me and say, what do I do if I have a, a, a PT that doesn't understand EDS? Well, what I tell them is, in chapter two, find a PT who could do muscle energy for the SI joint and then do your exercises on your own. If you have a question about an exercise, I'm sure the PT will be more than happy to look at it. Then when you get to the neck, find a PT who's willing to tape your shoulders and work on some muscle energy to the thoracic spine and rib and neck and do the exercise on your own. And again, find someone, a podiatrist or an orthotist who's willing to make you a good orthotic and then strengthen on your own. That's the best I can do it for you for those kind of things. But getting manual therapy and strengthening at the same time produces the best results that I found um, in my 15 years of treating this population. Um, so without any further ado, I will let you talk to Kathleen now, and she will explain what are some of the factors that kind of impede my protocol. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna move this down a little bit. <laughs> um, so what other members, team members for our patients do they need to see? So we need to think about that. I'm gonna get into that in a minute. Um, what are the areas that we begin to treat first? Kevin already um, talked about that as well. And how can we help family members at home to help the patients um, think about what the patient's goals are outside of PT? What are they trying to get back to? And then you have to think about what the lifestyle of your patient is. Are they, do they work? Do they have kids? Do they live alone? And what plan is realistic to, that they're going to be able to carry out and be successful with? And um, also, I treat a lot of children. And w when you're dealing with kids, you know, it's a little bit different. We're not going to have them go through every single page of, of the protocol. Um, so you have to kind of modify things and talk to the parents and see what is reasonable for their child you know, to uh, different ways to kind of go through and have them be compliant with some of the exercises, but also be realistic because they are, you know, kids. Um, and then what can interfere with the whole process of the protocol that we do and in, in screening for common comorbidities, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Um, whoops, you told me the wrong button. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh -oh. There we go. Okay, so what can affect progress uh, so if you're going through the protocol and you're not making any progress or you're getting really frustrated and things aren't going well, what could be some of the reasons? And often what we find is that it's these other conditions that have nothing to do with physical therapy that are affecting your, your ability to go through the protocol. So the first one is mast cell activation syndrome. And from the patients that I see, I'd say about 50% of my patients uh, do have mast cell. Um, and this causes excessive fatigue. The patients have increased pain due to the joint inflammation. Uh, they also can have increased subluxations and then the muscles can't uh, function as properly. Um, so they have difficulty strengthening. They all can, also can have some GI distress, which again can lead to um, having less energy, poor nutrition, nauseous, or you just really don't feel like exercising. Um, the next condition uh, is tethered cord, and I'd say I observe that in about 35 to 50 percent of the people that I see. Again, these aren't statistics of research or anything. This is just people that I see in my clinic. And these pa patients tend to present with leg weakness, uh, leg numbness, fatigue. They can have excessive back pain which is gonna make them obviously not as, as able to strengthen and, and do exercises. Um, they can also have chronic hip subluxations, making it difficult to walk, and they can also um, suffer from constipation, gastroparesis, again, making all that difficult to exercise. Um, other conditions, CCI and Chiari, I'd say I see about maybe 25% of my patients who have this. Um, they can present with chronic severe headaches, 
uh, difficulty concentrating, upper extremity weaknesses, they can have uh, visual disturbances, problems with their hearing, difficulty swallowing, balance issues, uh, fainting, again, all things that are making it difficult to exercise. Uh, the next one, dysautonomia or POTS. Again, I'd say about 75% of the patients that I see um, are affected by this, can cause irregular heart rate, shortness of breath, a decreased stamina with exercise. Uh, they can become easily de dehydrated, be lightheaded, fainting, get blood pooling. Um, the next one, which is actually a fairly newer one that I've been seeing in my patients, um, is endometriosis that these patients can have excessive back pain, increased ligament laxity due to the hormone changes, more subluxation, severe abdominal pain, and a lot of my patients will you know, be bedridden for a few days during their cycle, which again makes it you know, difficult to, uh, to exercise. Uh, the next one is food allergies, medication allergies, and tolerances. I'd say about 50 to 75% of my patients are affected by this. Um, this also can also cause a mast cell flare, which again now gives you more, uh, we just talked about kind of the issues that that can cause. Uh, fatigue, GI distress, and again, if, the, if they're having medication intolerance issues, if they're taking medication for their pain and it's not working, now they're going to be in more pain and, and be less able to exercise. And gastroparesis, I'd say about maybe 20% of the people I see have this. Severe abdominal pain, again, fatigue, not able to exercise. Um, so I like to kind of point out that, ironically, it's often the patients who come into us who say, you know, there's so much going on with me, there's no way you can help me, I have no hope, there's just, there's too much going on. Those are actually the people who we, honestly, we usually end up helping the most because typically these patients um, have many, one or, or often more of the comorbid conditions I just talked about and nobody's identified these issues, they haven't been treated for them, so it's kind of like someone going around with, say, diabetes, high blood pressure, who comes in and says, okay, I'm ready to exercise, but I'm not taking insulin and I'm not doing any high blood pressure pills. So. Um, with all these, you know, systemic things going on, um, and again, those are the patients who usually have more of a dramatic um, improvement once we can identify these things and get them to the right people. So we just kind of have developed um, some general uh, screening process for our patients. Again, we're physical therapists, we're not, you know, GI doctors and neurologists, but we can at least go through a screening process of questions and some physical tests as, you know, if we suspect these conditions, refer the patients on to the proper specialist to get the proper treatment that they need. Um, so I like to point out that, you know, it's really important to listen to, to our patients. And I've been fortunate enough to just work with a lot of EDS patients over the past several years and spending about one to two hours a week, every week with my patients, which is a lot of time together. And I ask lots of questions and I really try to listen, um, which that's allowed me to really recognize patterns and similarities um, among the patients to identify these conditions. I say, hey, you know what? It sounds like you might have mast cell. Let's you know, get you to someone to evaluate you for that and let's you know, see what it is. Um, so, I have here a success story of one of my patients. Um, so that is a picture of Kate on a slide. Um, so this is Kate uh, when she was five months after her tethered cord surgery. Um, and this was the first time in several years that Kate was able to feel like a normal teenager again. And she went to a carnival with some friends and had fun going down a slide. She was very safe, she used her cane, so very proud of her for that. Um, <laughs> and prior to surgery, um, she was having a lot of trouble attending college, keeping up with her classes, hanging out with friends, and she struggled a lot with being able to study for long periods and just simple things like brushing her teeth, doing her hair, um, and she had been dealing with chronic pain since she was 14. Um, so today, she is um, about a year after her surgery and she's living on her own at college. She has a, maintaining a very impressive GPA. She's looking at graduate school, she's going out with her friends and really starting to live a normal life again. Um, and she was someone who, on day one when she came to me, I identified that I you know, was questioning tethered cord, questioning mast cell, um, and got her to the proper people to get treatment for those things. And she's told me that her journey at Muldowney PT has really been life-changing. And Kate has actually traveled here all the way from Rhode Island. Please stand up, Kate, and <laughs> be recognized. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so she's, <laughs> so, um, so in closing, um, it's, I'm stealing a quote from one of my favorite, favorite people, Walt Disney. Um, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. And um, Kevin and I are very passionate about treating people with EDS and hypermobility and chronic pain. And we've really dedicated our practice to treating this population. 
and we treat people who have you know really complex issues. They failed PT in the past, um, so we do the impossible every day, and we try to help people with EDS and chronic pain live their life to the fullest and achieve their goals and dreams, like my family does. And that's a picture of my family at our, one of our favorite places, Disney World. Um, so we hope that we can help you or someone that you know who has EDS live their life to the fullest. And thank you for your time today.